When it comes to smacking yourself in the head and not smacking yourself in the head, then I would cast off shoulder. What what cracks me up is when I go out in the woods and a guy's got to hold on to a tree or sit across a log because he can't squat. Dude, the human body was meant to squat and crap. I mean, that's like our major... <laughs> like function yeah it can be both really subtle and just awesome like going to a megadeth concert and just just hits hard you know <laughs> i mean those big fish like you said they got big for a reason and more often than not you walk away with your tail tucked between your legs oh yeah and you just gotta salute him <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make it, so it's just the way it is. So don't shoot the messenger. If you're a vegetarian, I'm sorry. We just this, we got here because we ate meat. That's just the way it is. Stick them solid. Welcome to the Drop Jaw Flies podcast. In this episode, we are talking flies. I asked Jason for a list of his top 10, his favorites, the ones that he's caught loads of fish with over the years, and the ones that are always in his fly box. If you like this episode, leave us a review. We invite you to subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, or our YouTube channel. I'm Chad Nelson, along with my co-host, Jason RV. Here is today's podcast. Where do you even go fish? I mean, you have to go up by Flagstaff, or I'm sure there's cool places in Arizona. I just don't know about them. Oh, yeah, brother. We're going to get up uh, in that area like where you just mentioned and try and get some of Arizona's native cutthroat trout and uh, see if we can track down some Apache trout. Gila trout is close by. Uh, but, yeah, there's some really cool trout species here, and we'll, we'll get after them sooner than later. Absolutely. Um, so speaking of trout, real quick, Utah just announced uh, they are now doing the Trout Slam here in the state of Utah. You can sign up and uh, go for all three species of trout, which were historically native to Utah. What do you think well, about that? Uh, um, can I already just submit my papers? Because <laughs> I've done it. Can I just... Get a free pass, or do I need to do it again? <laughs> Officially, you can do it again, but it costs you twenty bucks. Wow! Well, the cool okay. thing is, you can do it over and over again. You just have to re-sign up, pay the twenty dollars fee, and once you get the slam, you get a cool medallion or a pin. And man, that's just a fun little competition. I think we should do it. Let's get Drop Jaw going there. Absolutely. I'm already yeah. one step ahead of you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. So I well, think um, I think Wyoming uh, did this. Yeah. And I think they one other state, them. right? Maybe Colorado, Colorado, was it? Yeah. I think Colorado does. Yeah. So it sounds like Utah's the third state, and that's really cool. Fun little challenge for guys to go after. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Let's get in on that, on all the states. Maybe do it this summer. For sure. All right, Jason, today, <clears throat> so for today's podcast, I asked you to send me your top 10 flies, your go-to flies, your favorite flies, the flies that you've had most success with. And I want to talk about those today and all the applications for those flies. So number one you sent me is the San Juan worm. The San Juan worm. And uh, I would not be without that and you you know that i carry a bunch of those um streamer fishing's my passion it's it's what i love to do but uh you, you just shouldn't be without one of those okay especially in the springtime um i would i love the pink uh versions of it either light pink or dark pink or even a combination of tan and pink but in the springtime and uh, when the water comes up a little bit and uh, a lot of those worms will get washed from the bank or little draws that are usually dry. Um, but as the water comes up, those aquatic worms are flushed through the system. And I, I don't know what it is. Trout eat the heck out of them. 
And if you want to catch fish in the springtime, especially any time really, but spring, the trout just seem to be gorged on them. So always, always have San Juan worms with you, red, pink, tan, maroon, uh, gray even, and uh, great fly. Yeah, those are just money. Money, money, money. They are. And you've caught loads of fish on those. Oh, oh. A ton. Yeah, maybe literal tons over the decades. I, I don't know, but <laughs> super cool fish. Or, or You catch super cool fish on them. Big fish, small fish, medium fish, any fish almost. Yeah. Good so, fly. Wouldn't be without that. So springtime is the best to pull out a San Juan worm in, in your experience? Yeah, um, but winter they work, fall they work. You know what I mean? Just they're always usually in uh, most rivers. So, but in the spring, it just seems like it's just gold money, even better than gold, maybe platinum. I, I don't know. It's it's a fly that I always have, and I have a bag full of them. Yeah, it's got to be the easiest fly to tie, right? I mean, I might be able to even tie it. I've seen super young kids. My brother, when he was six, could sit down and tie a dozen really fast. So they're a fun, yeah. You, Chad, I'm I'm guessing you could do a fly a minute, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, way different than tying up one of these. <laughs> <laughs> one of those big triple hook. Uh, that's the juby fly. Our juby fly, right? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Number two is the black woolly bugger. And I even have a lot of experience fishing those on when I used to be fishing spin rods. I mean, I think everybody's probably fished a black woolly bugger. Black woolly is, has been around for a long time, and it just continues to produce uh, fish because uh, some of the theories about the black woolly bugger is that it imitates so many different food items from little fish to stonefly nymphs to leeches. Um, so many animals, uh, or and I shouldn't say animals, but aquatic insects and fish invertebrates, gosh, look kind of like a, a woolly bugger. So even in low light to bright light, it just has that appealing quality and size that fish must love because they eat the heck out of them. Yeah, yeah. And another simple, simple tie, just... Load You could load up a box of woolly buggers in, in an evening, you know, tie up a box of them in different colors, and you have a really good chance of catching a fish no matter where you go. Well, and the cool thing about the black woolly bugger, too, is there seems to be so many varieties. I mean, guys can kind of get creative with the patterns that they tie. But you bet, yeah. That fly has been around a long time, has it not? Has been around a long time, and it... Seems to it's a multi-species fish catcher, and it's, it's been experimented with, you know, all over the world for, like I said, different species of fish. And you can, when you say woolly bugger, it, that is like how we've talked about sets of flies and subsets of flies. Well, there's all types of woolly buggers now, so in different colors and sizes, and, and it's. It has spawned a lot of different, you know, offshoots of that fly. So I love that thing, and I would not be anywhere without one. For sure. Is there a best season to fish a woolly bugger? Um, any season. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best season. <laughs> I knew that answer was coming, but... <laughs> oh, that's that's something that could be subjective, I guess, Um but, uh, you know, leeches are, are pretty active uh, in the spring, and, and I, would, I would throw one in a lake in the spring, you bet. For sure. Okay, number three is a beadhead pheasant tail. Ooh. Why, do you, why do you love that? Well, and depending on the size, just that brown color and the shape of it imitates all kinds of different food items um it can mimic almost all of your mayflies um it, it and that's the why uh, that's what it imitates our mayfly nymphs or that what that's what it was designed to do 
but also it just looks like food, man. And I wish, like I said, I wish we could sit a trout down and say, hey, what are all the – why do you love this fly? Why do you eat it so much? And they'd be able to tell us blah, 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 blah. But So we can only uh, hypothesize that it just looks like they're major food staples and they just eat it when they see it usually. Mm-hmm. So – if I if I'm fishing with a 16 pheasant tail and a fish refuses it, you drop down to an 18, and they might eat it. You know, it's just can depend on the size, but that color that the and with the bead or without. Sometimes I usually carry them with the bead in case I want to drop it down off of a dry fly. It has a little bit of weight to to go down. Because like I said, most of the time, no matter what, I'm going to be throwing these now. But if I am going to throw a nymph on, it'll it'll most likely have a bead just because of the versatility. Gotcha. And how long has the pheasant tail been around? I, that I don't know, brother. Um, a long time. A long time. <laughs> it's It really has. Um, and probably as we go on in our conversation, we'll come up on a couple other flies where I used to know the history um, and I just can't. I've been focused on other things, so I have forgotten. <laughs> oh, you've <laughs> had streamers on the brain. Um, so Excellent. with the pheasant tail, though, depending on the fly, bead head or not, you can use it as a dry fly or a nymph. Is that correct? Well, you, you can use it as a dropper off of a dry fly. And so what I normally like to do, depending on the depth of the stream, uh, say you're up high in the mountains and the stream is anywhere from a foot to uh, three feet, maybe in some of the deepest spots, um, I'll, I'll usually drop it off of a dry fly, um, six inches at the smallest amount from the dry, or 18 inches to 24 inches maybe off of a dry but when you cast it, that bead that's on the front is going to drop it down to closer to where the fish are, and it just – it's deadly. Yeah. It really yeah. is. So if we're, if we're going to carry some of these nymphs with us, because mostly what we're going to do as streamers, this is just a selection that we would take with us, kind of a staple box that we could go back to. Uh, you know, If we wanted to catch a particular fish and he's refused this, but we still want to catch him, these are the, the nymphs and, and stuff that we would have with us because there's thousands of patterns you could choose from. Yeah. And for those listening, every time Jason says this, he's holding a drop jaw fly. Uh, he doesn't leave home without them. <laughs> I need a little bit of music up there in the mountains. I can just. <laughs> <laughs> so a month ago, Jason and I took our wives out to dinner. And uh, we're sitting at a table, nice restaurant. I look up, and Jason has a drop jaw fly hanging from each ear. <laughs> <laughs> so when I say he doesn't leave home without him, he literally doesn't leave home without him. <laughs> I don't even know why you had those in your pocket or what you were doing with those in the restaurant, but <laughs> uh, they're just cool accessories, you know, to wear. I mean, you know, if you're into that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, number four on the list, Jason, elk hair caddis. Yeah, so dry fly fishing is something that I grew up doing, and I really I love it because of the casting that's involved um, and also because of the tradition. I mean, that's real fly fishing. Also, um, watching the fish come up and eat the fly is just an exciting thing, and it's fun to do. So an elk hair caddis has good floatability. Um, it has uh, mimics, obviously, caddis flies, but uh, trout love to eat caddis, and they're on all of our western streams, and so it's good to have some, some caddis imitation for, for that situation. So that's one that we, sh you know, I would suggest everybody have. Yeah. Again, is there a best time of the year to fish an elk hair caddis? They usually start taking off, you know, around Mother's Day, and then there's different hatches of caddis clear until October, and so in in different sizes and uh, some versions, uh, different colors. There's brown, there's uh, blonde, there's tan, of course, and there's black and olive. So I would, I'm gonna carry the tan with me. Um, because you know, to do the full assortment of caddis flies, again, there's just a tons of them. But 
I'm going to carry the tan elk hair caddis and with the right presentation and a good cast, you, you'll probably, in my experience, get a hookup when a fish is feeding on those. So that's, that's what I'm going to carry. So you said you like the tan. What size? What size have you had best luck with? I think the 16 is the all-around, all-purpose elk hair caddis fly, but uh, having one in an 18 can be okay too, but I like the 16 because frequently you're fishing them uh, in the evening, even into dark, and just that little bit of size can help you kind of gauge uh, where the fly is until you're casting, and then you just listen for the, you know, that... Until even into dark where you just have to wait until you're like, come on, force. And then you hear it and then you, you set and sometimes there's a fish on. So, yeah. But that 16 in the lower light situation will help you see it a little better. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the 16. Okay, awesome. Next on the list, Jason, is the stimulator. Whoa. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, oh my goodness. Th- yeah. Does that fly work on women? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to make any comments because I don't want to get, in, you know, too. Uh, <laughs> works on fish. I know that. <laughs> so so t- tell us uh, why you like that fly so much. Uh, mostly because of the name. But uh, other than that, uh, great pattern for uh, stone flies and, and, who knows what else? Uh, it just has this cool look. If you look at it from underneath it, if you ever go under the water and you happen to look up at it, um, it just has a really cool profile, similar to the shape of a stonefly. But I'm sure that it passes for a winged ant, maybe. Um, maybe even for some beetles, maybe even for a cicada. It just has this longer profile, and it has really good floatability, too. And so I'm always going to have those because they, they imitate, in my mind, quite a few different food items that trout love to eat. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to have those. Yeah, it looks like there's a little more to tying that fly than the other ones previously mentioned. Yeah, and I, I used to play with deer hair and, um, you know, both for the elk hair and for the stimulator, uh, you have deer hair involved in that. Yeah. Which floats yeah. great, and it, it's pretty durable. Um, and so I, I, I really I, – I probably will pick those flies because I grew up with them, you know, used them in my youth, and they're just effective. They still are effective, and so that's why I would uh, take those. Uh, for the stimulator, what size uh, have you had best success with? You know, that one, I really love the 10. 10. 10 and 12 has been my favorite. If you're going to imitate the specifically the bigger stoneflies, um, Terranar- Terranarsis californicus, you know, the big stone, then you have to do something different in, in most cases. But where, like I said, we're not really targeting that stuff all the time. So in our backcountry trips, I'm probably not going to have an imitation of the big stonefly so the stimulator works for a range of different stoneflies and other things as well so that's why i'm going to pick that one cool and historically fishing that fly is there a season that you've had best luck with that i mean obviously during the stonefly hatch but does it work other times of the year it does just because like i said it especially up high where the trout are really opportunistic they're not like keyed in specifically usually to just one food item so that represents or can represent this is our assumption of course many food items and so um down where a, where a hatch is going and the fish are keyed into a particular sa- uh, salmon fly not salmon fly stone fly hatch uh, that that fly can work but then also when there's not just one species of stonefly hatching, it'll, it'll produce for you with different – when different things are going on or maybe when nothing's going on. You just throw it out there, fish see it, and eat it. And if – here's where if they look at it but they don't eat it, that's when I go to the pheasant tail beadhead and tie that on below it. 
fish are going to come up and look at that bigger stonefly pattern. It also has more bulk to it, so it, it can float something like a, a fly hanging off of it. That's the other reason for it. And so I would uh, I carry it for that reason too. Zell fish will look up at that stonefly, maybe decide not to eat it, and then see your little bee head, bee head and then take that. And that happens a lot, brother. Yeah, so when you're rigging up like that, you always put the smaller fly as the dropper, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And it's always usually, I mean, always a nymph. You can run, of course, we do it, other people do it, tandem dry fly rigs too, but um, that that stone fly nymph just has a little, or not nymph, <laughs> <laughs> the stimulator in that size is big enough to float those smaller nymph patterns that are dropped below it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Awesome. Stimulator onto the SOS fly. Spencer's creation. Thank yes. you, Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> Higa's SOS fly found at Orvis and a few other places. I think he said Shields. Yeah. What a, what a great pattern to have in your, in your box, man. Um, so, Go with the pheasant tail, and that's generally brown. And then uh, the SOS is black, and sometimes fish are just keyed into that black color. And um, that's that's a pattern that I would not be without. When we go on our backcountry trips, the, the sun is high, and it's hot in the summer, and all of a sudden the fish have decided you know, they might chase this or look at it or roll on it, but they don't eat it. And we still have a lot of day left. I may, might want to catch a fish or two. Then I'm going to – I have that in my arsenal so that – for that situation because it represents so many different things. It It's segmented like a midge, but it, it kind of has the shape of a mayfly too. Um, it could even have the profile of an emerging caddis pupa. And there's just so many things that it represents that to have it in your box – it's almost like having 12 flies in one. And so you, you have that nymph, even if it was your only one and you used it in any situation when there's a mayfly hatch or not, you have a good chance of catching a fish. So that needs to be in your box. For sure. Well, and we had Spencer on the podcast a few weeks ago, and he guaranteed this fly. If you're having a slow day fishing, you pull out the SOS, tie it on, you're guaranteed to catch a fish. So. Awesome guarantee. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I take it with you everywhere. <laughs> I, what does it stand for again? Save, save our souls is the original, but I think he said save our skins. Yeah, which, save our skins. <laughs> same thing, basically, <laughs> almost. Yeah. Now, he explained it's it's kind of a cross between two flies. Uh, do you recall which two? I don't offhand. I can't remember, but I think he said midge and mayfly. Yeah, and to, it to me it really does, but could be a couple other things too. Yeah, he kind of took his two favorite flies and combined them into one. Yeah. So he he inspired me. I think I'm going to tie a fly called the SOL in his honor, but it's going to be a streamer. <laughs> And when you are SOL, you're going to be able to pull out this streamer, which is going to be a baby whitey variation, but kissed with a little bit more knowledge of what we've learned from baby whitey. And it's going to be the SOL. It'll have to be more guys. Sorry, but it's going to be one of those streamer patterns that you can go. We've tried everything, sir, and we can't catch a fish, but then we put on the SOL and we've caught fish captain. So um, That fly comes with the Russian accent too. Um, I, you know, the Scottish just didn't come out today. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> More of a combination. So, uh, we better get the gritty Scotsman on here to to, to show you how it's done. Get him on. Get him on here and get that edited. <laughs> <laughs> All right, SOS fly, awesome fly. On to the beadhead hare's ear. Yeah. Why is this in your top ten? Okay, so with the SOL and the pheasant tail, pheasant tail is mo mostly your brown. Um, great profile. SOL black, great profile. 
Hair Sears got the tannish gray color, and that will cover most all of your small nymphs. And when I was uh, really young, man, maybe 12, 13, my dad and I would go to the Welch's Fly Shop in Oregon. And it was so cool in there that the hair ear was the king back then. So we'd go into the shop and I'd just feast my eyes on all these cool flies. But the hair ear, it had the cool taper and then the wing case was wrapped up around the dubbing. Uh, and it, it was the coolest look to me. And, and one day I think one of the guys that was working there said, you, you like this fly? And that's the one that my dad, we would buy a dozen and I'd lose half a dozen on our trip, you know, being as young as I was. But he said, I said, yeah, how do you do that? And he tied one up for us and it was so cool to watch him do that. And so that spun off my fly tying days too. But that fly covers mayflies it can do caddis uh most it just imitates so many flies and you you could go buy a bead head or non-bead head hair's ear take it to a river no joke uh cast it in with a, a reasonable drift and if a fish sees it and he doesn't eat it then you know that's a weird fish man just walk away <laughs> <laughs> just that fish is either blind or, you know, I'm, well, I'm not sure. He's eaten that and been stung so many times by it. He's like, whoa, I'm not eating that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an awesome fly. Yeah. So so that's our top seven so far. The next three are streamers, uh, drop yes. jaw flies. Before we get into those, I wanted to ask you, of the top seven, do you have a favorite or maybe one that was the first that you just fell in love with? Well, I and honestly, the first one would be the beadhead, Hare's Ear. Mm -hmm. um, some of the honorable mentions that I, I have too, but just we kept this one short, <clears throat> would be the WD-40 and the RS-2. And those imitate betas mayflies and midges. So I and I would carry those, but beadhead, all those flies, Chad. I it would be hard for me to pick one over the other. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Like, what's my go-to? What's my number one? Mm -hmm. I I yeah, it'd be hard for me to not take the worm. <laughs> oh man. Well, there's so many cool flies, and like you said, to narrow it down to ten. You know, when I asked you for ten. You had a hard time, so yeah, it's like who's who are the like what are the best cars or what's the top ten favorite song? You know, uh, it you just go Ugh, there's so many, but I, like I said, th these are the ones I do carry with me uh, all the time. So, but I do carry the other one, like I said, the WD forty and the RS twos. Mm -hmm. And there's always the hopper, you know, that, there's other flies I have, but these are kind of the, for our list, that's what we've got. And they're awesome flies. Okay, moving on, number eight is the Baby Whitey, Drop Jaw Flies Baby Whitey streamer. Oh, there it that, is. Lift it up a little higher for those watching right there. Double hook. This is our most proven fly so far. Well, we came out with it first. It's been fished more than any other streamer, and it's caught a lot of fish. At least from our streamers. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Because there's there is some awesome streamers out there that people have and are in circulation. And um, but as far as ours go, I wouldn't hesitate to put this one on at any time. Yes. Yeah. And to date, this fly, uh, we've been sent pictures of, of people that have fished it in salt water, caught bass. They've caught freshwater bass out east. It's caught pike, uh, Lahontan cuddy, and then all sorts of trout throughout the Intermountain West here. Yeah. It, it imitates just a bunch of different uh, food items. Called it Baby Whitey because that was what it was intended to imitate, but uh, I'm sure it imitates small trout, uh, day starter suckers. In, in some way, it just looks like a, a fish, you know, just like a little fish that needs to be eaten. <laughs> so, 
Looks like a tasty morsel. And that fly is what, five and a half inches approximately, Jason? This, the, so the baby whitey, uh, depending on which hooks that we use to tie it on, and there's some different color variations, um, is four and a quarter generally. Four and a quarter. Yep. Sometimes uh, four and a half if we use, uh, you know, just depending on the hooks that we use. But these are just a little bit smaller, and this is just the, the four and a quarter version. And five to six weight watt rod works well with this fly. Yeah, I'd say your your heavy five probably, or even your medium action five, is where you'd want to start to throw this. There's a purple, a purple version. So it's it's again, it can be tied so many different ways. I can't see very good. There we go. Um, and uh, it has. It has produced some awesome experiences and memories already. Great fish on that fly. <laughs> so, Absolutely. If you love chucking streamers, these are fun flies to throw. Fun streamers to throw. Yeah. Next on the list is the Drop Jaw Flies Chub Fly. Chub streamer. Yeah. Why do you love this one so much? Well, in, in the big reservoirs, there a lot of times chubs are the forage item, and so <clears throat> now, and in, in especially in our reservoir that's closest to us in Strawberry Reservoir, chub is maybe one of the the key uh, food items for the big cutties, and so when that fly goes on, I notice that some of the bigger fish come out to play. <laughs> when when that's swimming through the water and so it and even in in the summertime like when when spencer and i went and fished strawberry and we had a good time when we put that fish on it kind of changed thing of uh, that fly on it changed things for us so when the fish are keyed on to chubs and they see that uh, and i wish i had one to show maybe we'll have to dig one out of our photos and put one up so people can see it but that head has a cool action to it but it it mimics the chub really well, mm-hmm. and so we've had some great experiences with with that fly. And it's not as it hasn't been circulated as much as the whitey, but for us in in our situation where we fish, how we fish that that's one that we're not without either. For those listening uh, or even watching, I guess to just describe it. It is a medium sized head. So right now, the juvenile trout head, which is this head is the biggest the chub head um is a little bit smaller and if you go online and you and you look up utah chub and they're in a a bunch of different states out in in the west um it has a head similar to the chub head so the way i designed it and just to give you a little bit of heads up on how the heads are designed they're um they were done carve carvings and then we had them cast so that we could reproduce those uh, first carvings that we had done. So that's it's a, it's a head carved like a chub, and but it does have a little a cool action to it as well. Yeah, and, and describe our fly pattern. I mean, Jason, how big's the fly? What does it look like? Articulations, yeah. all that. So it's five and a quarter. Mm-hmm. Has three hooks. And you can substitute that middle hook with a shank if you don't want to throw a hook in there. Um, we, we've we caught fish on all three hooks on our, our triple hooked flies. So we're just, we're just going to have them there. If you want to fish those uh, safer, then you just pinch the barbs down just a little bit. It's good to have a little bit of barb. It's, you know, if you go full barb, you can do damage. There's no doubt about it. The big cutthroat that we fish for, their mouths are stout i mean they're they're very tough to penetrate and so even if you pinch the barbs down a little bit you'll be able to set the hook better but anyway the fly is definitely gray on the back and sometimes bluish to a dark olive and then it comes down off the back into tans and grays down to white and then you can embellish with flash or whatever you want to so um but that's kind of how it goes we don't have the chub fly for sale but the head is for sale so you can make your own chub fly and eventually our our 
pattern that we use will be for sale. Awesome fly. Awesome fly. Fun to fish. Yes. And rounding out the top 10 is the big boy that you like to hang from your ears that you're holding in your hand, and that is the juvenile trout fly. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to recreate that. I, I was so tempted to lean across the table and just yank down on those heads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you can't now, man. <laughs> you might be tempted, but you can't do it now. I, I don't know. I, it looks kind of like if I had one of those tall black hats, like I might be an Orthodox practicing <laughs> Jew, maybe, from what I can see. But yeah. I I love this fly. I I. I love it. So this does have the three hooks. And I tied these just – the middle hook on th these particular ones is just a little bit shorter than normal in length. And so we do have a fly tying uh, tutorial video up on our YouTube channel with this fly. Uh, Jason goes through. It's about 60-minute video. Shows you how to tie it. But tell us why you love this fly so much, Jason. I think it's the action – and with the head, it, it you see it swim in the water, and you think, that's a fish. And uh, I took my best fish at Strawberry on, on this fly, um, I believe, and the chub head. It's a toss-up, but I just love the look of it. I love to tie it, and I think the, the bigger fish have their eye on this when it's coming through the water. Mm-hmm. I actually took my best fish on that fly, too. Although I will say, you know, newer to fly fishing and casting, that is a big fly to cast. So <laughs> <laughs> after, after a while, uh, I can't say I love throwing it, but I love the fish that I catch on it. So we need to do a podcast on throwing these, these bigger flies. And a lot of people that fish streamers a lot would go, hey, you know, six and three quarters to seven and a quarter isn't really that big because there are a lot bigger flies. But this is weighted. And when you have that combination of weight and bulk, it becomes tricky to cast sometimes. So it, it is castable. We use the Belgian cast a lot to get things started out to just kind of keep it under constant uh, tension because of its weight and energy when you're throwing it around it it wants to go where it wants to go it's kind of hard to control at first unless you have the right line weight um chad uses an eight weight line and an eight weight rod i use the eight weight rod uh and a nine weight line and i'm probably going to buy a 10 weight uh rod and pr either a 10 or an 11 weight line to uh, throw this even better so that's that's kind of the range, you know, a chub chub pattern, I'd still go with a heavy 7 or an 8. The juvenile trout, uh what Chad set up is uh soon to be the Orvis Helios 2 and either the bank shot or the Rio outbound short. That's our our lines. I I do want to try that Streamer Max line from Airflow. I would like to give that a shot. But for us, the tried and true lines right now are the Rio outbound short and the Rio bank sh or the Orvis bank shot. Mm -hmm. uh, I am pretty excited, Jason. My Helios two came in the mail yesterday. Let's see that bad boy. You got it? No, no, it's it's out in the truck. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's still being hid. It's still in hiding. <laughs> uh, yeah, that that went right into the back of the truck, uh, Lisa. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh she watched these you're so busted <laughs> no she doesn't listen uh she'd fall asleep listening to fishing talk <laughs> that's so cool <laughs> yeah i've had a i've had a chance to te uh, cast that rod before test it out nice nice rod oh yeah so stoked so I will throw the bank shot line on that rod and, and try it out that way. And uh, on my other rod, I do have the Rio outbound short as well. Yeah. Cool. So that's what we'd recommend to throw these. I, I, I like to have the bigger profile streamer too. Just um, a lot of this is based on size. So you got your baby whitey, four and a quarter, your chub at five to five and a half, and the juvenile trout, six and three quarter to seven and a quarter, 
in length just to cover the full range of sizes that fish might be eating at that time. Yes. And we do have a video of that fly on our YouTube channel as well. And when that is in the water, it looks so good. Yes. Irresistible. I, I, I or anything, you know, just, uh, no, it looks like a fish swimming through the water and that's, that's what it was designed to do and catches fish, man. Yeah. So some really nice fish. So that's our top 10, guys. Uh, I know a lot of you probably have your favorite flies, too. But if you haven't had a chance to uh, test any of these flies out, they are awesome flies. They work well. I think most guys have probably thrown all of these at one time or another. Uh, but particularly for us living out here in the Mountain West, uh, these flies work awesome. Yeah, I know a lot of guys that are buying the hedge chat are coming up with their own patterns. And um, I want to say to check out, and this would be on Instagram, uh, at Mount Kiwi is his Instagram page. And you can see a fly that he's created with the baby whitey head. And he calls it the Kiwi Sparkler. This is not the Kiwi Sparkler, but if you if you get online, you can see it. And this just it just ripped it up this winter. Uh, just crazy uh, how many fish that took. Yeah, he and, he told us that this was his best uh, best year yet, best winter. I should clarify, uh, fishing streamers. He, yeah, he just hauled in big brown after big brown on his kiwi sparkler. And so uh, another, there's so many guys to mention, but uh, I know uh, RB Tech, RB Tech One at RB Tech One on Instagram came up with a super cool fly um, for uh, calico bass and uh, sand bass and and that one might come into circulation and then pan at panther branch bugs down in georgia or alabama sorry alabama sorry, alabama sorry man <laughs> <laughs> he's developing a shad fly with one of the heads that looks really cool and if you go on his site and i'm going to post a picture of that fly uh, probably this evening um, and people can see that one, but these are just head. So the heads are in circulation and people are making flies and it, it's way cool. There's a lot of people that experimented with them like, uh, Oh, fly at fly tosser, at fly tosser 30 at fly tosser 30, uh, yeah. super cool fly patterns that he's been coming up with. And so I don't know if there's any that are, that he's developing or developing to be a go-to streamer. He has a bunch, but he's just in the experimental stages at bent fly fishing. Um, th there's so many guys that are, I could mention. Yeah. And let's open up the invitation again, guys. If you have bought heads from us and tied a pattern that you're just ripping it up with, we love to see those pictures. So yeah, send them our way. We love Please. to see those. Please tag us because we in your photo so that we know there's so many now. And seriously, we could go on for a long time of people that are tying uh, flies with these. Yep. All right, Jason. Awesome list. Any parting words? Just get out there and stick them solid. All right, friends. Thanks for listening to the Drop Jaw Flies podcast. We'd love to hear your feedback. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, or our website, www.dropjawflies.com. Please subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, or our YouTube channel. Now get out there and hook a big one and stick them solid.